Okay, welcome back. We are in Module 2 of American National Government, and today we are going to look at and talk about the shaping of our nation's constitution. Everything else that we will discuss in this class will be based on our constitution that was created at the Continental Congress in the, the very beginning of our nation. But first, it's really important to talk about what events, what happenings led to the American Revolution and to the foundation that development of our first constitution. We're going to look at some of the problems that the framers faced as they attempted to create this brand new um, constitution and it started with the Articles of Confederation and we'll see that those did not work for the American government and they had to start over and, and create a new constitution and we're going to look at some of those things. Uh, we're also going to compare and contrast the arguments of the Anti-Federalists to the Federalists and we will explain the process of amending the Constitution. Uh, we're going to look at some of the underlying issues that surrounded the dissatisfaction of colonial Americans. It was a, it was a good, there were good times and there were bad times, but there were a lot of things that led up to the Declaration of Independence. It was written to build, the Declaration was written to build a, cons a consensus or a, it acted as a framework for what the early Americans felt like government should be and what they hoped that it could achieve. There was no question that America wanted their own set of written laws and they started like I said with the Articles of Confederation and it was created to to appease Americans to address some fears that early Americans had about a government that could potentially be too strong that might have too much power and authority over the over the states um, and so we know that the articles did not work and that did lead to the to the creation of a new uh, constitution all right so since the American Revolution was not fought by one class against another or to replace an economic system, it's often classified as an ideological revolution. It was a fight that was based on ideas and philosophies of the governing. The rebels agreed that government was necessary, but a government that was too strong was going to take away individual liberties and freedoms, and people knew that they needed to choose their own leaders who would protect their rights and also not step outside the boundaries of the government that was created for them. You're going to hear names like of political philosophers like John Locke. These were people um, who who were quoted when people were considering uh, creating this ideal system of government, a government based on the people, a government with that would create freedoms for people instead of taking them away. And so with these new ideas of political system, while they were taking root, colonists were definitely developing a language uh, to rally support for independence. The most famous term that you probably are already familiar with and, and know very well is no taxation without representation. Parliament insisted that the colonists were virtually represented by people who lived in England and that they did not have direct representation on American soil, and this was a problem. Furthermore, uh, before the revolution, the the American the colonists wanted a government that was uh, clearly defined in writing, and that was not so. Uh, they cited British examples like the Charter of Liberties, the Magna Carta, uh, the 17th Century Bill of Rights as the sort of constitutions that would guarantee natural rights and limit governments. And finally, they were challenging the idea of sovereignty, which had been unquestioned throughout British history. History. The colonists insisted that authority could be divided at local and national levels, for example, and that there was not just one final authority in the land. And so this was a new way of thinking for, for American colonists. A number of acts and events that prompted the actual revolution, um, these are included, and I'm going to list some more. It might have been very different uh, if, if, a, if Britain and America were physically closer together, but they were not. They were not able to communicate quickly and directly, and so that caused a problem in the, the early era as well. The physical geography meant that America had to develop a certain amount of self-government, a certain amount of independence uh, from Great Britain on their own just because they were so far away. 
Two main economic groups ruled in colonial America, the New England merchants and the southern planters. Those were the earliest and the largest groups of people. Their strong loyalty to Britain gave way beginning in the 1650s and a, with a sequence of British actions that definitely threatened their economic freedom. So you had men, women, families who were living in, in North America who were living in the colonies who were creating their own systems of, of independence, financial financially, um, industrially, you know, and as far as farming goes, these people were creating a way of life for themselves. And when Britain, Great Britain, started to threaten that way of life, that is when tensions began to rise. The Navigation Acts were a set of new rules for trade to and from the colonies. The goal was to give England more control and a larger share of the profits from the colonists, and they insisted on having a say in what could be shipped and what what was taxed, and that was an, a very early problem for the colonists. The molasses tax, uh, it taxed molasses that came from anywhere other than the West Indies, which made it more expensive to the colonists. The Sugar Act lowered the tax, but in forced this law more harshly. Uh, the Currency Act was designed to keep British creditors and merchants from being paid in paper currency that might be lower in value than gold or silver, which was hard to come by in the colonies. This meant that paper currency, though available, was not legal really in most instances. Okay, so these are some of the earliest, earliest problems um, that the, the British and the American colonists faced. The Stamp Act was a direct response to the expenses of the French and Indian War, um, and it required that legal documents receive a, t a tax stamp. Now, the French and Indian War was a war that that left Great Britain with with a lot of things. It left Great Britain with more land holdings in North America, but it also left Great Britain with a lot of debt. And it also, the British were a little bit resentful of the American colonists. They said that they could have stepped up and fought better. They had not really contributed to the war financially. And so Great Britain responded with this series of, of acts and taxes that was designed to tax the American colonists to, to pay off debt and to, in some ways, kind of make the colonists pay for, for their lack of, of um, commitment during the French and Indian War. And as you can imagine, it only it only strained the relationship between the colonists and Great Britain even further, okay? Um, and so protests were loud. Protests to the Stamp Act were loud and strong and led to the formation of what we know as the first Congress of the American Colonies. This Congress created the Declaration of Rights and Grievances, which was presented to Parliament. It took a boycott of British goods to repeal the Stamp Act, but Britain did repeal the Stamp Act, but it was immediately followed by the Declaratory Act, which told colonists basically that they were subject to British laws, that they did take away the Stamp Act to appease the, the colonists, but at the same time, uh, this Declaratory Act told the British uh, the colonists that they were under British rule no matter what. And so it did not really undo anything that the British had already done. The Townshend Acts uh, saw local legislators and assemblies being broken up if they were not compliant with British laws. These tensions created as a result of these acts led to the Boston Massacre of 1770. And again, colonists uh, reacted. They reacted by boycotting uh, British goods, okay? And so the, the British the British Massacre, I, I'm sorry, the Boston Massacre, I definitely encourage you to, to look that up. It was, in fact, uh, only, let's see, only five, let's see. Five people, yes, I'm sorry, I had to check my facts there, but five people were killed. It was called the Boston Massacre uh, by resistance leaders and a physical sign of British oppression in many ways. Samuel Adams became a leader in pointing out the atrocities and the immorality of the British government and what they were doing. And this, this Boston Massacre was commemorated each year just to keep that spirit alive, okay? Um, and so that was one of the first major happenings on colonists uh, in on North America. American soil that that was an outcry against the British government in addition to the boycotts 
the Tea Act of 1773. Uh, that meant that only the British controlled East India Company could provide tea to Americans without a tax. And so what it did was it made it cheaper for the Americans to buy tea from the East India Company that it did for them to buy the Dutch tea, which had been dominating the American market. Colonists were not happy with this. Colonists responded with what we know today as the Boston Tea Party, and they threw East Indian tea into the harbor. First, they refused to unload it onto the docks. They would not allow it to come off of the boats onto the docks. And then they decided to dress up as Indians to um, and to throw all of the tea into the harbor. Um, now, this and equivalent to to today's to today's money. This was a, a massive amount of tea and a huge financial loss for the East India Tea Company. Um, and so they were punished. The American colonists were punished uh, for this act. They closed the port of Boston. The King George uh, closed the port of Boston. Um, he restricted self-government in Boston. He allowed royal officers to be tried outside of Boston or in England instead of on American soil. Um, and he also uh, forced that troops in the colonies had to be housed uh, by colonists themselves, which really enraged the, the colonists. Uh, when Boston refused to compensate State Parliament for the tea. The British government clamped down with these uh, these examples, and it's called the Intolerable Acts, taking away a lot of liberty in Massachusetts. This prompted 12 of the 13 original colonies to form the first Continental Congress in 1774, where they planned resistance to an overbearing government and were guided by Thomas Jefferson's a summary view of the rights of British America. The problem with the taxes was not so much the levies themselves, but that they were thought to be unfair. The colonists viewed this as, as an oppression by the British government because they were not asked. They were not considered when the taxes were established. The British believed that the colonists were properly represented. They had representatives in Parliament, uh, but they did not have anyone from Brit from American soil or on American soil uh, to represent the, the colonists. But actually, actually Actions like the Stamp Act convinced the American colonists that they had no genuine representation in the British political system. So they decided to act. They set up the First Continental Congress. Um, the First Continental Congress met in September of 1774. Representatives from all colonies except for Georgia met at that first conference. Uh, when the Continental Congress met in, again in May in 1775, the battles in Lexington and Concord Massachusetts had had already begun the Revolutionary War, but before the war began, the the colonists, the Continental Congress, tried one more time to to repair the relationship with Great Britain. They wrote something, a statement of grievances against British acts, and they recommended that colonists begin to start making military preparations in case they needed to attack British troops, but that was not their goal. They did immediately stop all trade with Great Britain. And they agreed to meet back in a year. This is very significant because the battle would begin before the next year rolled around. So Lexington and Concord, after the Continental Congress met, Massachusetts people began to prepare. They began to uh, prepare to fight, and they were called Minutemen. Uh, they were called Minutemen in case the, the British attacked quickly. They could be ready in a minute. And on April 18, 1775 is when the war really broke out. Uh, British General Thomas Gage was sent to arrest Samuel Adams and John Hancock for leading a rebellion. Uh, there were a thousand soldiers who were marching to Lexington and Concord, and they were looking for these two men, and they were actually also looking for illegal military supplies. <clears throat> Paul Revere um, and William Dawes rode out, rode out into the countryside to warn the people, the Minutemen, that Gage and his men were coming. And so the Minutemen removed all the artillery, the ammunition that they were coming to look for. And it, this was when shots were fired and Minutemen died. And those were the first shots of the American Revolution um, and the start to the war. Uh, the initial task to secure diplomatic and trade relations by the American uh, 
government was was key they had to form relationships with other nations in order to to have a shot at at really being able to defend themselves and to win this war against the british and so they went to work establishing relationships with france spain and the dutch republic because they were all opponents of the british and so they were happy to work with the colonists they also supplied troops uh, to George Washington's Continental Army and engaged in battles on the army's of, uh, on the army's behalf. The members of the Congress felt it was important to both justify their revolution and establish a framework for the new government. Thus, they developed the Declaration of Independence, written predom predominantly by Thomas Jefferson, and it was approved on July 4, 1776. It insisted that the rights of life, liberty, property, and the pursuit of happiness were unalienable meaning that they were natural they were inherent to our human condition we were born with those rights and could not be given away or taken away by a government the declaration was also meant to achieve common ground and create a nation which in this context meant shared sense of understanding among desperate peoples um, and emphasizing the principles the values and the outlooks that united them This famous painting shows the members of the Declaration Committee presenting the draft to John Hancock, President of the Second Continental Congress. The Declaration was an attempt to build a nation with shared goals and sacrifices, and it was a rallying point to assist in the fight for independence. So, before we had the Constitution as we know it today, that, that Continental Congress developed the Articles of Confederation. These were first approved in November 1777, and they served as the governing document of the United States during the Revolutionary War. The challenge for the authors of this document was to create a central government that expressed the nationhood outlined in the Declaration of Independence while also continuing the ongoing definition of individuals by their state. The Articles established a national government in Congress with members selected by state legislators, paid by the states, and able to be removed by the states. States also implemented laws. A supermajority was needed to pass bills and change the articles. Uh, it was required in order to change the articles at all. It required unanimous approval. These limits on Congress created a lot of problems. There was no army. There was no ability to regulate trade. There was no tax system to raise money. The government required the, rev the voluntary cooperation of the states, which did not happen fully. Without independent power in the central government, confronting international issues such as economic treaties was virtually impossible, and domestic concerns came to a head with Shays' Rebellion in 1786. Farmers in western Massachusetts protested the state foreclosure of property if taxes hadn't been paid. And so Shays' Rebellion was one of the very first instances of um, why the Articles of Confederation was not going to work. Shay and his men put together a rebellion. These farmers put together a rebellion and marched on the state of Massachusetts. And the national government did not have the manpower or the money to put down the rebellion. Uh, luckily for them, the governor of Massachusetts was able to pay some men to come together and to stop Daniel Shays and his men. But it was a glaring weakness of the Articles of Confederation and one that had to be fixed. Um, armed mobs of protesters prevented the courts from opening. The national government like had no resources to help in this situation in Shays' Rebellion. So like I said, private money had to be raised to form a militia and stop the rebellion. The strength of the protesters in Shays' Rebellion terrified political and business leaders. An armed mob had stopped businesses from going forward, and there was no way to disperse them. It was obvious that a stronger national government had to be created. Um, Congress was shocked by Shays' Rebellion. They called on each state to send delegates to Philadelphia. In May of 1878, I'm sorry, in, I'm sorry, in May of 1787 to discuss revising the Articles of Confederation. Um, and as we now know it, there was no revision. They just completely started over. But every state participated at this con uh, Continental Congress except for Rhode Island, who objected to the convention based on concerns that a strong national 
delegates met with a sense of urgency. I'm going back a little bit. I think my, my audio got cut off. Um, with a sense of urgency in the air, the national government appeared unable to handle international disputes uh, to establish civility and cooperation between the states, and they definitely could not handle domestic occurrences, domestic insurrections like Daniel Shea's rebellion. The delegates quickly decided that there was no point in even even revising the articles, but they wanted to actually establish a new set of ground rules for an American government. So what act did the British Crown Institute to raise revenue? The Stamp Act, Townsend Act, or the Tea Act? Of course, it's all of the above. All right, now we are going to move into the actual development of the Constitution. Uh, we are going to cover in this section the five main problems confronted the, that confronted the framers of the Constitution, the fundamental disputes on representation in government, allowing citizens to have a voice while also curbing their input and concentrating power through elect electoral procedures, checks and balances in power, and federalism. Federalism is a term that you need to be very familiar with. Protecting commerce and property, creating legitimacy with a stable framework that also allowed adaptability, um, and establishing a national defense so that we could protect ourselves. The framers were determined to allow for both strong federal and personal, for strong federal power and personal liberty so that there would be freedom, there would be order, there would be a national authority, authority, and the sovereignty of the states would still be intact in many ways. The nation was banded together for mutual protection, for prosperity, but individual states and citizens should be able to pursue their own needs and goals as they wanted to. This table shows the breakdown of the Articles of the Constitution and their sections. You can see how concerns regarding national unity were of greater importance and received thought and attention first. But let's look at how the, the framers actually um, decided on how they're going to create a government that we have today. And that has worked and operated for, for a very long time very well. Delegates to the Constitutional Convention were absolutely determined to protect the needs of their individual states. Their goal was a union of sovereign states rather than individuals. The first conflict that arose was between large states and small states, and the question being, should representation be based on population or should each state have equal representation? James Madison's Virginia plan said that the larger state, the larger a state, the more representatives it should have in the national legislature. The lower house would in turn select members of the upper house. Smaller states did not like this. They objected and preferred the New Jersey plan, which insisted that the same number of representatives be sent regardless of the population size. The problem was solved by the Connecticut plan, or it's also called the Great Compromise. This established a House of Representatives that was based on population and elected by the people. A second legislative body, the Senate, gave equal representation for each state and members were elected by state legislators. Not everyone was happy, but it did go forward. The other major issue was slavery, where the split was geographic between the states that allowed slavery and those to forbid, forbade in it. Northern states felt slaves should not count toward the southern state's population count when choosing numbers of representatives because the southerners called slaves property rather than persons. The South, which had argued that slaves were not people when being asked to pay taxes on land value to population, now stood firm. They would walk away from the convention if they did not carry this point. The three-fifths compromise was created so that the 60% of slaves counted toward the overall population. This number meant that neither region, neither region could dominate the other in the federal government. So it was very much a compromise. States that did not allow slavery thought it was very hypocritical of slave-holding states to want to count slaves as people for the sake of achieving more representation in the House, when they really considered slaves to be property. The three-fifths compromise was resolved <laughs> The three-fifths compromise resolved the concerns for the sake of creating the Constitution, but as we know, issues surrounding slavery remained a very prominent issue for years to come. <laughs> 
democracy. The classic de definition of democracy, which we've already talked about a little, is direct rule by the people. The framers felt that the people should have influence, but that there must be a buffer between what the people wanted and what the government did. This would create stability and guarantee the minority still had equal rights. The Constitution established two-year terms for House members and six-year terms for senators with staggered elections, as well as a four-year term for presidents. This meant that at no point could all members of government be dismissed at once. This was very important. If the people wanted to change this, they had to go through the complex process of amending the Constitution. Ultimately, the framers wanted to make it difficult for people to rewrite rules. The balance of power was seen as the best protection against excessive democracy. Each major branch of government has different functions and different responsibilities, and the legislature makes the laws, the executive branch implements the laws, and the judiciary interprets the laws. Checks and balances mean that each branch can either stop or implement the actions of the other. It was decided that federalism, the distribution of power across national and subnational governments guaranteeing their survival, would be the underlying principle of the new system. The state stood as a balance against the federal government while the national government checked the power of the states. Because the framers were so concerned about avoiding tyranny and absolute sovereignty in the hands of one person, they rejected a parliamentary system as established through much of Europe. It was seen as giving too much power to the majority party, but on the other hand, in a parliamentary system, government is not as at cross purposes and so can be more active and effective. The framers preferred that there be, that there be gridlock rather than concentrated power. The separation of powers gives each branch of government its own responsibilities, which overlap but are still distinct from the other branches. Each has the power to check the other if they have concerns. George Washington had been the, Ameri to, been the commander of the Revolutionary Forces, and he was seen as a national hero. He presided over the Constitutional Convention, and there was never any question that he would serve as the nation's president. Although George Washington was not, he did not volunteer to serve as president, instead he was actually asked to do it. He had actually gone home after the Revolutionary War to spend his life um, with, with his wife at Mount Vernon, and he was not uh, planning to get back, get involved in politics again. But the American people wanted him to serve as, as our first president. America's strength, their prosperity, and even independence were by no means guaranteed after the revolution. There are a number of international disagreements with Britain, with France, with Spain, with the Native Americans. The Constitution did establish federal protections, and with the president as the head of the military and Congress controlling the military budget and taxes, as well as having the ability to declare war. This meant that states would have to head Sorry, this meant that states, um, excuse me, this meant that states would have to head um, the <clears throat> the national direction on all military actions would have to heed the national direction. There was a very strong anti-federalist faction that objected to the system established by the Constitution. While federalists argued that a stronger national government would protect liberty more completely, the anti-federalists preferred a loose union of the states where the national government was weaker and more subordinate. The federalists felt that a buffer between the people and the government would be more effective and create more stability, whereas the anti-federalists wanted a system of more direct democracy with the national government much more subject to the demands of the people. Here we're going to look at how the dispute between these two factions played out. 
The Anti-Federalists, led by major, major revolutionaries like Patrick Henry, saw the Constitution as counter-revolutionary because of its focus on a central authority and the buffer placed between the people and the national government. They saw it as more concerned with the interests of landowners and businessmen and not the ordinary people. They were especially worried that the central government would curtail personal liberties or take them away. The Anti-Federalists argued for further restrictions on government power, a council that would review presidential decisions, state, co state control over the military, a larger house that would allow for more representatives, and a Bill of Rights that would protect individual freedoms. They achieved only the Bill of Rights, which might be argued as the most important of their demands. The Bill of Rights comprises the first ten amendments to the Constitution and is focused on personal liberties like freedom of speech, privacy, and assembly. The debates between the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists were fierce. They were strong. They used the media of the day, including speeches, handbills, and newspaper columns. Most famously, Federalist James Madison, Alexander Hamilton, and John Jay wrote a collection of columns that became the Federalist Papers. They discussed federalism, the separation of powers, the checks and balances from a theoretical standpoint. They were read by the most important men of the day who shaped opinion. Federalist Paper Number 10, written by Madison, insists that liberty is safest in a large republic because a large republic can control factions or groups of people. Factions are people who cluster with like-minded people, and they can threaten the rights of others. A majority in a democracy is nothing more than a large faction. A republic, however, can control factional influence. Madison argued that fewer representatives meant voters would choose honorable and virtuous men for office. Further, diverse districts would have mixed policy messages so that representatives would have to sift out bad ideas and keep the good. But would not be taken over by a single interest. Also, a large political system made for opposing interests, which is healthy for a nation, a government, and as they battled it out, majority factions were less likely to form. Ultimately, Madison argued for self-interest over communitarianism, saying that a person's self-interest is incentive to keep others from abusing power. Thus, self-interest protects liberty. Not all of Madison's arguments have modern uh, significance. His notion that voters would choose only the most noble candidates to represent them can be viewed as laughable today, although it was right at the time. Modern media, where groups are far more connected, means factions can develop much more readily today. We have social media, we have news outlets, we have radio, we have all of these media um, capabilities that were not there in the beginning. On the other hand, we can still see where a variety of interests brought to the table forces debate and mostly keeps any one person from dominating. Despite the persuasiveness of the Federalist Papers, the Anti-Federalist argument had captured a lot of attention. There was no assurance that the Constitution would, in fact, be ratified. It needed nine states to become the law of the land. Delaware ratified first in December of 1787. It took another seven months before the ninth state, New Hampshire, ratified it. Majorities were thin in a lot of states, sometimes as low as 51 percent. North Carolina originally voted against the Constitution, but changed its vote after it had been ratified. While anti-federalist feelings still ran strong, several factors contributed to the success of the Constitution. One major consideration was that people were more afraid of external and internal disturbances than they were of being of their liberty being taken away. Also, they knew that change was needed, and it seemed better as a young country with many challenges to accept the Constitution rather than to start over. The American the Constitution was also incorporated the American Creed with liberty, religious freedom, property rights, and democracy all part of it. Despite the persuasiveness of the Federalist Papers, the Anti-Federalist argument had captured a lot of minds. There was no assurance that the Constitution would be ratified. It needed nine states to become the law of the land. Delaware ratified it first in December of 1787. It took another seven months before the ninth state, New Hampshire, ratified it. Majorities were thin 
Amending the Constitution is a slow and complex process that takes place at the national and state level. At both levels, a supermajority is required to pass the amendment. Because this takes so much time and demands so much support, amendments tend to be thoughtfully considered and only those with broad societal approval are ratified. While there have been over 10,000 proposals to amend the Constitution over the years, only 17 have thus far been approved since the Bill of Rights. However, changes to the Constitution can be made in effect when a member of the judiciary interprets constitutional law in a new way that gives it different meaning. Thus, though the text of the Constitution is the same, the meaning changes and so does the law in question. In this section, we'll learn about the constitutional amendments and the critical role played by judicial interpretation. The framers wanted the Constitution to be flexible, but standing and enduring. Thus, they allowed for it to be changed, but only by a difficult process. An amendment must be proposed with a supermajority at the national level accepting it. Then it must be ratified by three quarters of the state because this is a long and difficult process. Only amendments that have broad societal acceptance end up as national law. There are other paths to amendment, but they have never been used and are not likely to be used. A national convention, while possible, has too many pitfalls. The known method, with all its problems, is at least effective. Because the path to ratification takes so long, many amendments fail because the opposition has time to organize and affect voters with their arguments. The most famous example is the Equal Rights Amendment, which stated that there could be no discriminatory laws made on account of sex. It was well on its way to ratification when opponents argued that it could create problematic solutions and litigation. Supporters weren't able to fight back quickly and hard enough and the amendment died. This is a visual to show you the path to amending the Constitution and what is required. Of the amendments that failed to achieve ratification, it's worth noting that the ERA and the amendment to grant the District of Columbia full voting rights failed when they were presented to the states for ratification. All the others failed to garner support in both the Houses and Congress. The states have rejected a number of amendments over the years, some of which we see became non-issues due to other circumstances. The first 10 amendments, known as the Bill of Rights, were ratified virtually upon introduction, but since 1791, only 17 amendments have been made law. The country has gone as many as 60 years at a time without a new amendment. This follows exactly what the framers intended, allowing for the Constitution to be a stable and enduring document. The amendments follow the logic of the Constitution, emphasizing government powers, the size of the electorate, and the relationship between people and government. Only three amendments deal with social or economic policy, and one of these, Prohibition, stands as an example of why social policy should not be included. It was repealed 13 years after it was ratified. We can see that the bulk of the amendments extend rights clarify articles of the Constitution, or make small alterations to those articles. Why do you think matters of social and economic policy have rarely been ratified? Something I want you to think about. While the text of the Constitution remains the same, judicial interpretation can change the meaning of the law and thus amend the Constitution. The framers were not opposed to the idea of making changes, they just didn't want swift and constant change. However, the Supreme Court stands as an option for those dissatisfied with the amendment procedure. Likewise, the court's work makes the need for amendments less urgent. An example is civil rights legislation. In 1896, Plessy v. Ferguson allowed states to implement racial segregation. Sixty years later, Brown v. the Board of Education came to the opposite conclusion. In these instances, a different reading of the law through different historical prisms drew different conclusions. An amendment might not have passed, but thanks to the court, it wasn't necessary.
And this is just a discussion question that I want to leave you with. What were the main objections to the Anti-Federalists to ratifications of the Constitution? Did the Federalists adequately address their concerns with the Bill of Rights? Are any of these still concerns today?